All right. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, that's OK. Uh, my name is Teresa Cavell, and I'm the co-founder of an early stage startup called Neopenda. And I'm going to be talking about our project, uh, leveraging IoT biometrics and the Zephyr real-time operating system for a real-world high-impact application, uh, neonatal nursing in Uganda. Um, so here's just an overview of what I'll be uh, going through today. We'll start with talking about the problem that we're trying to address, um, then an introduction to what we're trying to do. Um, then we'll look at some of our stages of prototyping, uh, the selection criteria, um, the process of uh, developing with Zephyr, um, and then a look at some test results in our Android app, um, and then the timeline of development, and we'll talk about some issues that have come up, um, and then end with the conclusion. So the problem that we're trying to solve with this device is high newborn mortality in the, we're trying to address is the problem of high newborn mortality in the developing world. Uh, this is a big global challenge right now. Uh, how do we uh, reduce deaths from preventable causes during the neonatal period, which is the first 28 days of life? Uh, so the, the scale of this problem is vast. There's 46 million newborns um, every year in the developing world uh, that are born, uh, that have complications at or around birth that require a special care and special uh, treatment. So about 3 million newborns are dying every year in the developing world, and the WHO estimates that 80% of these deaths are because of causes that are deemed preventable and or treatable. Um, so this is happening all over. It's happening in places like this uh, special care baby unit in the National Referral Hospital in Uganda, uh, where I took this photo last year. Um, so what's going on here? Why are newborns still dying at high rates from preventable causes? Well, there's a lot of you know, complex and overlapping factors that contribute to neonatal mortality, from things like a lack of um, good prenatal care to difficulty getting reliable transportation to health facilities in time uh, to actually getting high quality care in the health facilities themselves. Um, so ultimately, newborns are most frequently dying from three major preventable causes, and that's uh, complications of preterm birth, complications of birth asphyxia or um, intrapartum complications, and severe infections like sepsis, uh, tetanus, pneumonia, diarrhea, things like that. Um, so we decided to, to focus on targeting um, that problem of getting high quality care delivered in these low resource facilities themselves. Uh, the problem that we see in these hospitals is that there's just so many critically ill newborns that need care and need attention and treatment, and not nearly enough nurses and doctors and equipment and supplies to um, meet that demand. Um, so in, a, in an overcapacity newborn unit, you might see two nurses working at a time, and they're responsible for 50 or 75 babies at a time. And that's, that, that ratio is just not going to be good no matter what sort of resources you have, but the equipment that should be standard, like vital signs monitors, is often just prohibitively expensive in the first place. So, so given all these challenges, what can we do? Well, newborn mortality is a solvable problem. Um, in fact, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goal number three, um, it strives to end uh, preventable newborn and child deaths by the year 2030. So this sounds pretty ambitious, but what it means for newborn mortality is getting that NMR rate down to at least as low as uh, 12 out of 1,000 live births. Um, for reference, the, the rate in Uganda right now is 19 out of 1,000 live births. Um, so with this sort of current push for advancing newborn health, it makes visible a lot of opportunities for innovation, which I find very exciting as an engineer. So uh, with the rise of like IoT and small, low-cost embedded technologies, um, that means that we can, can sort of reimagine what's possible in, in uh, global health. Um, so these, these new IoT technologies, um, they offer a lot of benefits, like being uh, easy to implement, scalable, pointer, point of care, um, and they're getting better and better at meeting the, the cost and power constraints of low resource settings. So where can technology make a difference uh, specifically in newborn health? Well, most uh, innovations and initiatives right now are focusing on preventing or treating specific disease states. Um, so we've sort of identified a gap in between there in the continuum of care in helping uh, facilities and nurses better manage the large quantities of patients that they have to deal with um, and help them make more efficient use of the personnel and supplies that they already have. So um, we know that early detection of distress is really key in newborn care to um, helping get effective treatment to the babies in time. Um, however, right now in these settings, monitoring and diagnosis is a big unmet need. So to us, that means that there's a lot of opportunity for innovative tech to have a high impact. Excuse me, I think the lanyard is running into microphone. Oh, sure. I'll take that off. Thank you. 
All right, let me know if there's too much feedback. I can kind of hear it. Um, so basically, that's what Neopenda is trying to do. Um, we're an early stage global health tech startup. Um, our mission is to engineer innovative healthcare solutions that um, give newborns in low resource settings the healthy start that they deserve. Um, so my, my co-founder Sona Shah and I started working on this project uh, while we were graduate students in biomedical engineering at Columbia University um, about in early 2015. Uh, so we, we got some initial funding from Columbia to continue working on our device um, and over that next summer we formed our company and we went to uh, Uganda to do a needs assessment and really understand the, uh, the needs and conditions on the ground. Um, after that we were selected for an accelerator program in Washington DC called Relevant Health and then um, uh, this past spring, after we graduated, we started working on this full time, and we recently spent some more time in Uganda, and now we're based out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, so our, our funding partners include uh, Cisco and the Vodafone Americas Foundation, um, and our in-country partners are the Uganda Pediatrics Association and the St. Francis Hospital in the Sambia. Um, and now we're excited to be working on this project with the Zephyr Project um, to explore some you know, exciting opportunities for our technology. We aim to be a part of uh, transforming healthcare through the power of innovation and show the kinds of good that these cool, clever technologies can do when they're applied to really important problems. Um, so how are we using IoT tech for um, newborn health? Well, we're working on developing a wearable vital signs monitor that's designed specifically for newborns in these low resource hospitals. So it's a wearable device that measures heart rate, respiratory rate, blood oxygen saturation, and temperature. Um, and we've validated with neonatologists both here in the, or both in the United States and in Uganda that these four vital signs are really important to track in critically ill newborns uh, because they indicate um, danger signs in the baby when their condition is changing and they provide uh, clinicians with more of a thorough picture of their health status. Um, so the, the technology is using uh, reflectance pulse oximetry. Um, so it's going to be located, or it's going to be attached to a baby hat because the literature suggests that the forehead is an optimal location to accurately obtain this suite of vital signs with these, uh, with these sensor types. Um, so we wirelessly communicate from the wearable uh, to a central monitor that's deployed on a tablet um, or a laptop or a smartphone. Um, and then, then health workers can view the health status of all the babies that are being monitored in the room and be alerted in real time of newborns in distress. So this will enable health workers to um, better triage their patients and know when there's urgent emergencies that they need to attend to, as well as just have more detailed information to guide uh, treatment and diagnosis. Um, so the, the key constraints for this product are that it needs to be wireless. Um, so these devices, we know that there's sort of dozens of uh, newborns in the ward that may need to be monitored, and we want to be able to um, monitor them all with a, a single mo with a single central monitor, which is kind of the most cost-effective way to do that in these hospitals. Um, as well as when you have uh, babies in this sort of chaotic environment, having a lot of wires around can get hazardous. Um, it also needs to be low power. Um, power is an important constraint um, in, de in developing countries. Um, we get power outages happening in these hospitals a lot, and there's voltage and fluctuations and things like that. Um, affordability, also very important. The price point needs to be low to deploy in a, um, in a low resource setting, obviously. And then the ruggedness of the wearables themselves, um, they need to be able sorry, to withstand the, uh, the sort of environmental challenges of dust and heat and humidity, um, as well as the constant uh, wear and tear. Um, lastly, scalability. Um, so, we, we want to be able to monitor many babies at once, like I mentioned, and then it, in addition to that, the system needs to be um, applicable to different types and sizes of hospitals as well as in different countries because uh, we know that the need is very widespread. Um, so with this vision and these constraints in mind, we uh, started doing some prototyping. Our initial prototypes we built with the Arduino hardware on Arduino Uno. Uh, then we tried to cut it down to just the ATmega328 um, microcontroller and sort of breadboard the whole system um, with only the essential components. And that's what's in the, the top right picture there. Um, we initially were using the, our Arduino, the default Arduino software. And for sensors, we, we built a pulse oximeter with just LEDs and photo detectors, as well as te a temperature sensor. And then uh, we initially started off using Wi-Fi for the communications um, because we were more familiar with it at the time and because of the extensive backing for Wi-Fi. Um, 
the communications architecture um, at the beginning, we were just sending these uh, four-part vital signs uh, data packets um, over Wi-Fi to an HTTP server deployed on a Windows PC. Um, but there were a lot of things about these early prototypes that we knew we wanted to change. Um, one of the main things is that we knew for the final product that we wanted to um, use Bluetooth Low Energy um, because it's just so much more appropriate for wearable devices, um, in term, especially in terms of power consumption. So we are becoming more conscious of power management being a need for this product. Um, it also uh, BLE raises less questions about the risk, uh, safety risks with the amount of you know, radiation that's emitted by Wi-Fi. Um, we also wanted to start sending to different types of clients, so we don't want to be limited to a PC, but you know, Android devices, um, smartphones and tablets and such. And then lastly, the size. So um, we know that this device ultimately needs to be very small because newborn babies, especially prematures, are just very, very tiny. So we wanted to be conscious of that as our, with our um, decisions moving forward. Uh, so by, by partnering with the Zephyr project, we've been able to um, explore how cutting edge technologies like the Intel Curie module with the Zephyr RTOS um, can be used to get us closer to a deployable product that still satisfies the constraints of this application. Um, so we, the prototypes that we have with us today, they're using the Arduino 101 development board, um, which includes the uh, Intel Curie module, uh, which is a low cost SOC designed for wearables. Um, and the uh, Zephyr kernel. So Zephyr turned out to be uh, very well suited for this application because of its modularity and its design for resource constrained systems. Uh, the sensors that we have on this prototype, um, they're a pulse sensor from pulsesensor.com, um, which we're using obviously to get the pulse rate. And then we also developed and implemented a uh, algorithm to derive respiratory rate from that same pulse rate data. Uh, then there is a lily pad temperature sensor, um, just a thermistor temperature sensor off the shelf. Um, and then for pulse oximetry, we um, have breadboarded a sensor using red and infrared LEDs, as well as a light to frequency converter. Um, and that's how we're getting the, the blood oxygen saturation measurement. We decided for this uh, prototype phase to go with the off the shelf sensors uh, in order to reduce the risk and so that we could um, sort of leverage the you know extensive amount of um, feedback that's out there from the Arduino community and the existing sample code that's out there. Um, so these prototypes are using Bluetooth Smart. Uh, the uh, Curie module has BLE integrated into it. Um, so we're communicating over BLE to an Android-based um, mobile application. So uh, let's dig a little deeper into why we why we selected the Curie module and the Zephyr RTOS. Um, so for Curie, it's low cost, low power module. Um, it enables us to make accurate DSP measurements uh, with the 12-bit analog digital converter using the sensor subsystem array. Um, it also has a built-in Bluetooth low energy radio, um, which I just mentioned on the previous slide, but it um, ended up being pretty advantageous for us because the sort of the interface between the, the host processor and the BLE was already there. And so we think that saved us a bit of dev time as well. Um, there's also built-in accelerometers and gyroscope sensors and a pattern matching engine. Um, so that holds some potential for us for further development if we decide we want to you know, measure additional things with those sensors as well. Um, and then lastly, the size. So the, the Curie module has like an 11 by 8 millimeter footprint, which is pretty small. Um, and it's not going to be limited to the large Arduino 101 in the future. Um, so we liked that it was pretty small. Um, next, the Zephyr kernel. So Zephyr turned out to be a big step up from just Arduino software for us um, because it, it can support the, um, the ARC core, the DSP subsystem, and the x86 host chip of the Curie module concurrently, uh, whereas Arduino can only run on the, uh, the DSP subsystem. Um, the Zephyr kernel also supports multi-fibers and interrupts for uh, complex sensor manipulation and communication. So it's able to, to cleanly handle the data coming in from across all these different sensors simultaneously, uh, whereas with Zephyr, we could only, it could only handle one uh, single background task at a time. Uh, next, the, um, the x86 chip, it has more RAM, 80K, I believe, for um, supporting complex BLE applications when you're dealing with multiple sensors. Um, again, Arduino, it only has the RAM available to the DSP subsystem. Um, we also benefited from the rich support for drivers that are already embedded out and sensors, um, as well as uh, Zephyr's uh, sample code and a reliable software development kit with cross tool chain. Um, so we'll look a little more at our experience of developing with, with Zephyr. So that, that Zephyr SDK, 
um, when using it, we found that there's already a board support package for the, supporting the Arduino 101 um, with, uh, cross, with tool chains to compile for the DSP subsystem and the host processor um, at the same time. So um, this enabled a quick installation of the compilers and tool chains in just a couple hours. Um, and we're also able to get the, the GDB debugger working with both the DSP subsystem and the host processor. Um, we use the Eclipse integrated development environment uh, running with the GDB for debugging. Um, and then thanks to the sort of, you know, the open source nature of Zephyr, there was a lot of sample code out there for us to look at for using BLE. Um, we were able to uh, use the peripheral HR sample, uh, for example, um, as a starting point for getting our pulse rate measurement working. So we were able to start with that code that was originally uh, just supporting the, the x80 or the um, DSP subsystem, and then um, expand that for our measurement. All right, so the measuring the four vital signs. Let, we can go a little, dig a little bit more into this. So the first two, the pulse rate and the respiratory rate, um, were both calculated from the AD measurement using the pulse sensor.com sensor. Um, the, we used the ARC core, um, the sensor subsystem, to measure the analog input using the ADC driver. Um, and we did have to do some adjustments to the AD measurement um, to support the 12-bit AD resolution. Uh, next for temperature. So we took those measurements with the, the lily pad sensor, like I mentioned before, the MCP9700 sensor. Um, we had to part we partitioned the arc um, the arc system so that it would support multiple tasks. So we split the the pulse rate and the temperature rate measurement into separate tasks, um, and we also for this had to do some uh, calibration adjustments to support the the 12 bit um, AD resolution. Uh, next, the the pulse oximeter. So this remember this is the not quite off the shelf one. Um, we breadboarded the red and infrared LED and the the TSL 235. A light to frequency converter. Um, that's the part that actually measures the, it reads the light intensity. Um, so we, we multiplex between the two LEDs to calculate the absorption ratio and use the, the GPIO driver and its callback API um, to calculate the frequency. And on Zephyr, uh, we were impressed with the, um, the repeatability of the driver in getting that frequency measurement from the TSL-235 part, uh, whereas with Arduino, we saw a lot of variation with that measurement. Um, so I've Diagram the data flow here so we can kind of walk through it. Um, we start with those three sensors that I've just described, um, and then on the ARC core, we're doing all the calculations for those measurements. And then we use the, um, the IPM driver to communicate and send the data from ARC core to the x86 um, processor. Uh, the x86 processor is responsible for sending that data to the BLE stack. Um, so in the, for the Bluetooth communications, we, we use the, the heart rate service um, for sending the pulse rate measurement, and then we just appended onto that the uh, respiratory rate measurement as well. Um, next, the health temperature sensor, obviously we use that for transporting the, or for sending the temperature measurement. And then we added on a new Bluetooth GAT service uh, to support the uh, Bluetooth specs for the pulse oximeter measurement as well. Uh, so this is all ultimately getting to the Android app um, on the Android devices. So we use the, um, the NRF51 um, NRF tools app to um, receive and uh, verify all those measurements. All right, so how did this work out? Um, here's some preliminary test results um, for the pulse rate and the blood oximeter um, or the blood oxygen saturation. Um, this is as they're displayed on the Android app. We did this testing just by putting the sensors on adult fingers for now. Um, and we uh, determined the accuracy by comparing to just a, a commercial pulse oximeter and a commercial thermometer. Um, so pulse rate, uh, we found that our readings were pretty much identical to the, the commercial pulse oximeter. Um, and then for respiratory rate, there's still some assessment um, for this one, but um, we're seeing a consistent uh, 20 to 30 percent offset from the true value. Um, next, for temperature, um, we're get, we are finding a, a variance of plus or minus two degrees Celsius when compared to that uh, commercial thermometer. And then uh, blood oxygen saturation. Um, we're still toying with some stability issues with this one, but uh, we're seeing the resolution be about, about the same as on the commercial pulse ox, um, but it doesn't track as well at low levels right now. All right, so this is all, hap all being visualized on the Android app. Um, we were able to get a basic Android app running pretty quickly. Um, its main functionality is just to receive and visualize all that sensor data. Um, 
So the, the three main uh, functionality of it right now is the first uh, panel is uh, just visualizing the sort of active devices. Um, we're hoping right now it should be supporting up to 10 um, what would be patients. And then it also needs to uh, display the real-time sensor data and um, display trend plots of the historical data points, which will ultimately be very valuable to clinicians. Uh, one of the, the next steps for the app is going to be implementing an alerting protocol. Uh, so we want to be able to um, initiate you know, audio and visual alerts when the vital signs go outside of a, a preset threshold range. Um, so that will be uh, one of the next steps as well. Um, so we included a timeline to sort of give an idea of the amount of uh, development effort that went into this. We did complete this project in under three months. Um, it took about a week to ramp up on Zephyr. Uh, getting the pulse rate measurement going on Zephyr was about a week as well. Um, and then adding the respiratory rate onto that was another couple days. Uh, the temperature measurement on Zephyr uh, was about a week as well. And then pulse oximetry, um, since we had to do more hardware work with that one, it was about a week and a half. And then uh, to communicate and display the measurements for all four of those um, on the Android app was about two and a half weeks total. So we wanted to look at some of the issues that uh, came up during development or that we anticipate uh, with this device. Uh, the first is the overestimation of arterial oxygen saturation in subjects with dark skin. Um, so the literature su uh, suggests that there is a predictable overestimate in the um, oxygen sats in uh, subjects with uh, pigmented, darkly pigmented skin, especially during hypoxia. And uh, with hypoxia, we mean um, when the blood oxygen level is low. So we're going to be seeing this a lot in the field with the newborns because a lot of them have, you know, suffer from birth asphyxia or they're premature with underdeveloped lungs. So we want to anticipate those challenges. Um, the an additional. Um, a related challenge that we foresee is that there's evidence that cerebral pulse ox sensors may induce more variation during hypoxia than the finger pulse oximeters. Um, so um, without, they see a, um, a dynamic change in the, um, the absorption ratio during hypoxia, um, which requires some additional adjustments to the calculation. Um, so these, these first two issues, um, they're with, they're need to be solved in the software uh, with calibration once we start to collect more data. Uh, so we think that we'll need to implement a calibration protocol where we can um, sort of get a stable measurement on each new wearer to maximize the accuracy. Uh, the next issue is the complex sensor and data manipulation. Um, so for this one, I kind of touched on it earlier, but it has more to do with the uh, device requirements and the selection of the hardware and software platforms. Um, since we're running three sensors in parallel, there's, we're using a lot of the functionality of the RTOS that we thought this might be an issue because um, we have so many uh, concurrent tasks like uh, reading the data from the sensors, uh, sending the data between the two cores, pushing, the, uh, pushing it over to Bluetooth. Um, so we we're concerned that this could be you know, using too much of the capacity of the RTOS and kind of reach its limits. However, we, we chose Zephyr because of its um, sufficient sensor driver support, like I talked about earlier, um, and it's, um, that its software can support these multiple sensor measurements and simultaneous background tasks. Um, next, the, or lastly, the, the power consumption and extending the battery life. Um, so I've talked about how power is an important constraint with this uh, project. Um, and there's still a bit of work to be done with uh, power as well. Um, I skipped Bluetooth, I'll go back. Um, so with power, um, we're, these prototypes are currently running on, the, on just uh, nine volt batteries, um, which we know we don't really want in the long run. We want the, um, in the final product, we aim for it to be able to last for like five days of intermittent to continuous use. Um, but for now, it's been fine while our priorities have been um, implementing Zephyr and getting the, the, all the sensors working. Um, so go back up to BLE. Um, so that was a, the next issue, um, BLE stability and connection control. Um, we're still refining, fine-tuning the, um, the BLE system. Um, there's some work to be done in improving the um, ease of uh, discovering and connecting uh, to the sensor devices, um, as well as ease of um, installing that uh, BLE monitoring app on the Android devices. Um, we also still need to um, assess how many BLE connections the app can feasibly manage at one time, as well as um, work on just improving the, the stability of maintaining those connections. 
Um, so we're looking forward to, to working more on the testing and ultimately to deployment of, the, of a completed solution. Uh, my co-founder and I have been working a lot with clinicians in Uganda, and we're excited to be partnered with the Ugandan Pediatrics Association um, and St. Francis Hospital in the Sambia um, for, for planning and executing pilot studies, hopefully starting sometime next year. Um, our plan is to demonstrate the feasibility and the impact of this sort of solution, um, first in Uganda, and then expand to other low-resource settings in East Africa and around the world that have similar needs. Um, so with that, I guess I invite you guys to all come see our, our demo prototypes at the Zephyr Project booth in the next couple of days. Um, I'd love to speak more with people who are interested in our mission in newborn health and interested in healthcare solutions that use clever elements. Um, I'm excited to learn from all of you, and I hope that we can leverage innovative tech to reach vulnerable and underserved populations. Thank you. So that up. All right. Take any questions if there are any. <laughs> yeah. One question. Um, how many uh, developers do you have working? I mean, you showed your timeline. Was that all yourself, or were there other people working on those uh, different stages? Um, there were other people. The, do you know what the size of the team was, Scott? It was a couple. Yeah, I think we had only two that were primary that were working on the project. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they have a pretty solid background in Linux and sensor development, so they have a good background, but Zephyr was new to them when they started it. And so the effort estimations were based on a lack of familiarity with Zephyr. Thanks. Uh, Cisco. Yeah. So while we were students, um, we presented at the Rice Business Plan Competition in Houston, um, and that's where we got the prize from Cisco um, from their corporate social, social responsibility arm. Um, and then Vodafone is a, a grant that they offer called the Wireless Innovation Project. Um, so we um, applied for that uh, last, I guess last spring. It was awarded in June, um, and we ended up winning first place in that project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you get linked up with them? Um, so we started in Uganda because we had some connections at hospitals there. And then by going to Uganda twice, we ended up meeting just a lot of people in the newborn health space there, which turned out to be pretty small. So we've gotten pretty well connected there. Um, I think some of our physician advisors um, introduced us to people at UPA. Um, so now we're uh, partnered with them. They do a lot of uh, clinical trials and things like that. Um, I'm not extremely familiar with that process. Maybe Jeffrey can help out. The question was, what does the, what does the eclipse? eclipse? Oh, the right. eclipse. Do you know how they operate the eclipse? I don't know. We do have a guy that can answer the question. <coughs> not, we'll have. Okay. Yeah, please come by. Sorry. Yeah. I have one question. Uh, I think this is a uh, medical device. Uh, do you need any certification for to be able to produce products? Uh, once we, for commercialization, we intend to go through CE Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, for clinical trials in Uganda, we need the um, the IRB approval for those studies, as well as approval from the Uganda National Council of Science and Technology. Um, but we do intend to go through CE Mark uh, before we uh, commercialize, obviously, um, and rather than FDA, since we're not commercializing in the United States. Okay. At least not yet. Do you do much processing of the sensor data locally, or are you just sending raw data to the app? Um, for some of our prototypes, we've been just extracting those waveforms directly and doing that manipulation ourselves. Um, ultimately, it will be the other way around, hopefully, once we, start, once we get the refinement a bit better. Yeah, we can we can plug it in here too. What's your what's your partner's 
background or co-founder? Uh, she's a biomedical engineer as well. Um, she's our CEO, so she's been doing a lot more um, business side than I have. But we both have an engineering background and are kind of wearing a lot of different hats. So we're hoping to expand our team pretty soon to include some other expertise. Do you see this applying to adults? Yeah, so we, we think there's a lot of opportunities with this sort of technology to expand to different patient populations. We're starting with newborn health because that's sort of our passion and what we think there's a big need in, but we think we could easily adapt it for, for peds, for like surgical applications, um, different patient populations for sure. Do you have a competitor? Um, in Uganda, no. <laughs> um, the sort of competition for this is just kind of manually measuring vital signs. Um, there's other like low cost like pulse oximeters and things that don't measure the full suite of vital signs continuously. Um, and their price points tend to be a bit higher. Um, we would definitely have competitors in like a United States or a European market. Um, but we do have some different advantages with sort of cost and the um, what we can do with our monitor. So you mentioned the price point. What is your price point? <laughs> um, hard to say right now. We're aiming to be in the ballpark of about $50 per unit. Uh, yeah. you, you mentioned the, the problems with respiratory, uh, tracking the respiratory rate. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain a little bit about that? I thought that was interesting. Yeah, so we've sort of developed these algorithms based on existing literature, um, and so that we're still kind of playing with those a lot. Um, it, we're tracking over like 10 to 15 seconds right now, um, so there can be fluctuations that we don't capture or that um, too many fluctuations in that period, so we're not really capturing everything that's happening. But you're using the heart rate to calculate. Yeah, so from the heart rate, we get that the plasmograph waveform, and then there's detectable um, modulations in that waveform that correspond to respiratory rate. So, for example, like the, the baseline changes in the plasmograph over multiple heartbeats, um, and we can correlate that to the respiratory rate. So there's, we're, we're playing with, you know, we might need to add in Fourier transforms and things to get a more uh, refined respiratory rate um, because it's sort of, it's, don't want to get too much into the algorithms, but it's sort of a weighted average of three different types of modulations in the pleth waveform. Um, and so we're still playing with the best way to, to do that accurately, if that makes sense. Did you, did you ever think of combining the accelerometer with, with your algorithm to try to improve the accuracy? Or? Um, we, haven't, we haven't tried that with, this, uh, with the Curie module. That's an interesting idea, actually. Um, on, the, on the forehead, I'm not sure if the accelerometer would um, pick up the respiratory rate changes. We are planning on testing out the device in different locations around the body. So perhaps if we did it as like a chest band, we could capture um, the respiratory rate from the chest expansion as well. Is it sensitive, the accelerometer? That kind of I think it would be. Um, if, it was, if it was over the lungs, I'm sure it would be. I mean, it would be a lot of noise. It would be a lot of noise, but then if you correlate it with, yeah. you know, probabilistically, if you combine the two, you might be able to get some 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 clarity out of that noise. Yeah, that's an interesting right. interesting idea. Would also just I mean, I can have an accelerometer sitting on my desk, and somebody walks by, and I can see it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, sorry, and the the actual heart rate. Um, how how much? What's your resolution? Are, are you are you capturing the actual waveform? Or the yeah. So we're getting the. It's measuring all the peaks of the pleth waveform. Just the peaks. Essentially, well, we're, we're counting the peaks. That's how we're counting the, the pulse rate. Okay. Yeah. Is this a sealed device? In other words, do you like, charge it with a proximity charger? Or? Um, ultimately, we want to, it'll probably have to be um, a, some sort of plug charger. We're, we're hoping to use the, um, the phone port, I forget what it's called, that is in most uh, cell phones that people use over there so that if they lose the charger, they can use their phone charger. Um, but I think a, like a conductance charging or something is not really feasible at this time for just based on cost. I'm still moving too much. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your questions.